Thank you very much, son. Christian, a wonderful song that you're offering to God. We believe that whatever we are doing right now is an offering to God, our song, our prayer. And so what we are doing right now amidst this pandemic is an offering to God. Our worship, our sermon, whatever we are now is an offering to God because God actually is saying, Jesus is saying that wherever we are now, true worshipers will worship him in spirit and in truth, according to John 4.23. Uh, I'd like to say happy Sabbath to all. If you happen to watch this one online, I'd like to tell you that today, Saturday, is Sabbath day, the best day of the week. God actually demonstrated this in Genesis uh, 2, 1 to 3, and even in Exodus commanded that this is a part of the law, commandment. And so we are here worshiping together as a family. This is our family worship, our a family ministry. Uh, because now a lot of the churches around are having the respective worship meetings and so we are having this one and i would like you to know that why we are doing this one you might be thinking well nobody should stop us from doing this the reason is the one shown on your screen because this is jesus commandment to teach all people to observe all things that he has commanded us and he said lo means behold i am with you always even to the end of the ages in other words his promise is he will be with us when we do teaching his word when we do discipleship in verse 19 of matthew 28 and we have this end time messages here in the series from jesus volume 2 this is very wonderful so a lot of these messages and it is good to finish all of them and so right now, right here, the Sabbath day, the Sabbath morning is an evangelism. It is a proclamation of God's gospel. And a topic is very wonderful, a formula for a crime-free society. Do you wish that your society is crime-free? Do you see any crime-free society today? It is very hard to find. It just seems that every society right now is not crime-free. And you see a lot of crimes going on around. This is illustrated by the picture right now. And so here is the next picture that will tell us about another fact. The nice thing about crime, someone said, is that it usually happens to someone else. Maybe Dr. Eleanor Banks of Chicago felt that way until she was shot in the leg as she tried to beat off two armed assailants with her purse. Now, the next picture will show. Possibly that view was held by Walter and Mabel Nelson of Michigan until a gang of toughs broke into their home one night, tied them up and drove off with their automobile. And pleasant as the thought may be, crime is out of control. No longer can we sigh apathetically or blitherously shrug our shoulders and say that crime is something that happens to someone else. Another picture will show. Every time the clock ticks, another crime has been committed. Crime and violence are stealthily creeping throughout the world and some night soon. Who knows? It may stalk your dark, your darkened uh, hallway. Look at this next illustration. Statisticians claim we stand better than one chance in four of becoming the victim of a mugger, a rapist, a burglar, embezzler, or other criminal. Riots, political assassinations, hijackings, murders, terrorist kidnappings, and government corruption shock the world. Now, beginning in the 70s, a new morality and situation ethics were illegitimately born. It was a time and came to mean do your own thing, and that could mean anything from smoking pot to streaking naked in public places or aborting an unwanted baby. Very bad, isn't it? It was a time when neon signs blatantly beckoned the men on the street to, to topless bars and porno movies, when gays and lesbians came out of the closets and lived in roommates and bashly proclaimed 
their status. Oh, ho, ho. Even here, same sex marriage. In the 70s, were shocking. Well, the 70s were shocking, but now in the 21st century, millions have never known anything different. And that behavior doesn't shock the world anymore. It has become commonplace. Many authorities believe that the soaring crime rates and immorality found in society today are the ugly products of the permissive teachings and models current in our government, homes, schools, and churches. You think so? From the home, a new generation of pain children have emerged who are questioning, skeptical, and challenging. Children love to imitate, and yet, who are to be their ethical, moral, and spiritual role models? Fathers lie to the government, mothers seek abortions, and both parents cheat on each other. Their children see it all, and the broken homes are living ugly scars. Who is to instill a sense of right and wrong if parents cannot or will not? Surely parents cannot leave so great a responsibility to the schools. But the question we must ask is this. Who determines when a situation is right? Here. It is not a judgment of even good people often impaired at times. Is there, if there is no standard of right and wrong outside of ourselves, we can justify almost anything. We may steal to support a bad habit, commit adultery if we are attracted to someone, or shoot a person we dislike. But the Bible reminds us we are not good judges of what is right and what is wrong. It says in Proverbs 16, 23, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of what? It is the way of death. Even the churches are teaching that God's standards of right and wrong, His commandments have been abolished, or they are no longer relevant, or they are impossible to keep. As a result, many people are following their own desires, doing their own thing, and society is reaping a bumper harvest of broken homes, juvenile delinquency, and violent crimes. The Bible says, they saw the wind and reap the whirlwind, according to Hosea 8, 7. Yes, and to say, we're discovering we do not get freedom by throwing out the rules. Remove the standard of right and wrong, and what happens? Chaos follows. Roland R. Hitzstag, former editor of Liberty Magazine, wrote, 20 centuries ago, the Apostle Paul wrote a crime report directed to the Christian church in Rome, a city where dissipation, it says here, crime and moral rot were foreshadowing decline of the empire. The Apostle laid it on the line. Thus, because they have not seen fit to acknowledge God, he has given them up to their own depraved reason. This leads them to break all rules of conduct, according to Romans 1, 28. Now, a long time ago, God gave us a formula for crime, or I mean a crime-free society. And had it always been followed, crime would never have existed. Everyone would be safe and happy any place on earth. Now, look. When the children of Israel camped at Mount Sinai, the Lord came down to meet them and said, you see this in Exodus 20 verse 2, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bandage. First, the Lord identified himself as the deliverer from slavery. He was the one who had opened up the Red Sea before them. He was the protector. In other words, he was saying, I care for you, you can trust me. Then he spoke his divine law so man could know how to live in peace and safety. So man would know what was right and what was wrong. God spoke these words in Exodus 23 to 13. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself a, a carved image. 
You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And the fourth commandment here, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. What is the seventh day? Now we know the seventh day is Saturday. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet. There's a lot in there. There's a lot in there. What to covet? Anything that is your neighbor's. As Israel listened, they were greatly moved. If that was God's will, they determined to do it. But then, knowing how forgetful we humans can be, and not wanting to trust the exact wording to the frail memory of man, God wrote it all on two tables of stone with his own finger. Now we read it in the next here slide. And when he had made an end of speaking with him in Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of the stone written with the finger of God in Exodus 31, 18. Friends, I want you to realize that even though this was the first time that God had given his law in, in written form, it was it has existed from all eternity, long before Sinai, or even Adam and Eve. The eternal and changeable standard of right had been the basis of God's heavenly government. In fact, the angels were governed by it. They could choose to follow God's law or choose to ignore it and rebel against it. Satan and his angels chose to do their own thing, make their own rules, and this rebellion led to the expulsion from heaven. But there were angels who chose to follow God and remain loyal to his law. And we read it in Psalms. It says here, Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word. In, in Psalms 103 verse 20, Adam and Eve had a knowledge of God's law in Eden. But they felt the emotions of shame and guilt after wrongdoing. They recognized they had disobeyed God by taking something that did not belong to them and by choosing to follow another God. Look, I want, you to to, I want to tell you the story of Cain and Abel. When Cain became angry because God accepted Abel's offering and not his, the Lord asked him these words, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. We read in Genesis chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. God's law had to be in effect at the time, for we are told, where there is no law, there is no transgression. According to Romans 4, 15. Transgression is the breaking of the vi or, or violation of any law according to webster's 21st century dictionary 1992 edition so i want you to realize that abraham obeyed the law before abraham knew and obeyed the law of god long before the spoken law at sinai god said he would bless abraham and his descendants now we read it in genesis 25 or 26 verses 5 Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, my laws. And so, after the Exodus, just a few weeks before the Israelites reached Sinai, the Lord rebuked Moses because the Israelites were violating his law by gathering manna. When? On the Sabbath. Look, even if it is good to gather manna, right? Because that is food. But gathering under the Sabbath for the sake of themselves, not for, for others, that is not good. And that is to be gathered actually on the sixth day. We read it in, in Exodus 16, 28 and 30. And the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? So the people rested on the seventh day. In other words, the seventh day, Saturday, is a day of rest that we need to keep holy. So you see. The fourth commandment was recognized before Sinai. Yes, God's law is the eternal standard of right for the universe. 
And really, should it surprise us that God has a law governing his kingdom? No. Here, the Apostle Paul wrote, For God is not the author of confusion. Let all things be done distantly and in order, according to 1 Corinthians 14, verses 33 and 40. There can be no orderly government without laws. You know that. No harmonious, happy, safe society without rules. Nature itself has laws. Even children cannot play games without rules. In the chambers of the Supreme Court of the United States, towering above the heads of the justices, appear two great figures carved in stone. One represents majesty of government and the other majesty of law. And between the two appear the two tables of the Ten Commandments. But impressive as they may be, commandments etched in stone or attached to chamber walls are not enough. The Bible says right here in the next slide, for not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God. But who? But the doers of the law will be justified according to Romans 2.13. Now you see, not only is it important to know the commandments of God, we must also respond. Jesus said, if you love me, the correct translation is, you will keep my commandments. That is in the, in the Greek, not this verse. You will keep my commandments. It, it means... If you love me, you will naturally keep my commandments. It is not a command. When you love, it is not by force. You will naturally keep my commandments when you love me. That is what it means. In fact, Jesus, after quoting from the Old Testament, pointed out that love is the basis for keeping all the commandments. When he said in Matthew, you will see here, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, according to Matthew 22, 37 and 38. And then he said, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. Now we read in verse 40. Now, if we really love God with all our heart, mind, and soul, we certainly will express that love by keeping the commandments. And so what other people say that there is no more commandment, that is actually wrong. It has been estimated that more than 36 million laws have been drafted by man to control behavior. But in just 297 words, God drafted a code of conduct that in essence covers all human behavior. What a God he is. Don't you think so? But more importantly, unlike the defective or unwise laws that men make and remake, the law of the Lord is perfect according to Psalms 19 verse 7. Theologian Augustus Strong wrote, Law is only the transcript of God's nature. Today, we would say the Ten Commandments are but a profile of God's character. Now what is a character? A character that is unchangeable for I am the Lord I do not change that is the character of God according to Malachi 3 6 you see any change in the law of God would make it less than perfect being a perfect law it can never be altered that is the truth Jesus spoke when he said these words and it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail, according to Luke 16, 17. But you say, I have always felt that the Ten Commandments restricted my happiness, sort of fence me. God never meant his law to be a burden to man, but to restrict his happiness. On the contrary, God intended them to be a wall of protection shielding us from sorrow and guilt. He intended that his law would ensure everyone's freedom and safety everywhere. In fact, God said, Oh, that they had such a heart in them, that they would fear me and always keep all my commandments, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Deuteronomy 5.29 just like 
we will guard rails on bridges and mountain roads to keep us from plunging off the road. As you see in the picture, God gave us his law to protect and guard us on the road of life. What do we do? But what do we do against the law? There's another reason God gave man his law. For by the law is the knowledge of sin, according to Paul in Romans 3.20. In fact, Paul said, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet, according to Romans 7.7. 7. Now, Dr. Arthur Bates tells of an African princess who had been led to believe by her subjects that her beauty was unsurpassed. However, one day, a trader came to her village and sold her a mirror, something that did not exist in her land. When she looked into the mirror, she was horrified by her ugliness and smashed the mirror into pieces. Can you imagine what happened? In the same way here, God's law is like a mirror. And as we look into it, just like the African princess, we may not be pleased with what we see, for the law points out sin in our life. Destroying the law or ignoring it will not change our condition. The imperfection is still there. The more you look at yourself in the mirror, the more you will see your imperfection. Even if we like to destroy the law, even if other people say there is no more law. That is what James meant when he wrote, for if anyone is a hearer of the world, and not a doer is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror for he observes himself goes away and immediately what happens he forgets what kind of man he was but he looks but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work of the word of the word this one will be blessed in what he does that's according to james 1 verses 23 to 25. now the law points out sin but no amount of good things we do in the future will erase the sin committed in the past it means even if we obey the law our sin cannot be erased by us you see the law cannot atone for man's sin. Atone means cover. It cannot save. The law cannot save. What happens? The apostle Paul said, For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. It means righteousness would have been by keeping or observing the law. According to Galatians 3.21. It is not the law that brings forgiveness and salvation. Who brings forgiveness? It is God's grace. It is Jesus. Only through Christ's sacrifice can man have eternal life. It is not by the law that we can have eternal life. It is by Jesus. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, according to Romans 6, 23. Friends, those who are watchers online, I want you to realize here, eternal life is the gift of God. It is not your gift. It is the gift of God freely given to us, to you and me. Even if I kept the whole law perfectly from this day forward, the sins I have steadily already committed condemned me to eternal life. Friends, I want, to, I want you to realize Jesus had to pay the price of my sin on Calvary's cross. And only by his grace can my sins be forgiven. Now that I have accepted him as, and, and his grace, I will obey him. That obedience is the evidence of whether I really love him, whether my faith is genuine, and whether my heart is changed, whether I am born again. That's clear enough, isn't it? In other words, our obedience is a demonstration that we are saved. In, in other words, if we do not obey God's law, it is a show that we do not have faith, we do not, have, we do not trust Him, it means we are not saved. We cannot 
be saved by good works. We can good, but good works are the fruitage of salvation. Fruit means the evidence of salvation. Salvation always has been and always will be by grace. Men have always in all ages been saved by grace through faith. Please mark that down in your memory and even do not forget it. Look, I want to show you the next slide. Perhaps this can best be illustrated by the story of a young man who killed someone in a fit of anger. He was very angry because of his anger, he, he, he killed a person. He was apprehended and taken to a prison. As he contemplated what he had done, he recognized he had broken the law. He felt a source of guilt and sorrow. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. He was sentenced to die, but before execution, the warden handed him a pardon which read, pardoned by the grace of Governor Brown. Now, you tell me, does this mean that the prisoner is now free to live a lawless life, not following the law, and do his own thing? Not at all. Because he was pardoned by a gracious governor, the young man should feel more than ever, ever his obligation to uphold the laws of the land. In other words, he should feel obligated to obey the law because he was saved. Can you imagine that? Friends, more importantly, God's law points out our sins and helps us feel the need of a Savior. As we accept Christ as our Savior, He provides forgiveness and also the power to keep His commandments. As He promised, I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now we read in Hebrews 8, 10. It is easy to do something you love to do, isn't it? Right? Right? You agree with that? And that is what the Lord promised to those who choose to follow Him. He will write His law in their hearts, so they will love Him to do it. So they will love to do it. That is the only way man will be able to obey and follow God. That is by loving God. When they love God, it's easy to obey. It was because of his love for his father that Christ was able to keep the commandments. Friends, it's the same with us. Do we have the same intensity of love? If we do, then it will be easy for us to keep God's law and follow God's will. John 15.10 says, I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. That is what Jesus said in that verse. And Jesus asked us to show our love for him by keeping his commandments. In other words, here you will read in John 14, 15, that is the, the correct translation from the Greek is, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It is not an imperative here in this verse. that You keep my commandments if you love me. No, no, no. In other words here, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 14, 15. In other words, friends, it is that love that makes us keep God's commandments. That is why God is so clear. God is so clear to love Him with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul. The greatest demonstration of love and obedience to the will of God was vividly portrayed on a cold, dark night under an old olive tree in a garden. With drops of blood coursing down His face, the Son of God prayed this prayer as you can read it in matthew 26 39 oh my father if it is possible let this cup pass from me nevertheless not as i will but as you will friends will you do the same thing will you do the same thing and you say god's will i will do your will oh god will you do this thing on the cross if you were jesus the fate of the human race hung in a balance a guilty world was to be saved or lost would this young galilean put all desire for life and human fulfillment aside and die at the calvary he could wipe the sweat from his brow and say let the sinners suffer the consequence of their own sins or he could let wicked men nail him to a cross 
so man could be pardoned in that awful crisis when everything was at stake jesus dipped his pen of love in the crimson ink drained from his own veins and wrote pardon across your record and mine what a wonderful truth it is friends right the old ragged cross on a hill called mount calvary is an eternal memorial of the price god was willing to pay to satisfy the claims of the broken law and to save guilty men and friends if the law would have been abolished or changed jesus death on a calvary would have been unnecessary yes he gave his son to die on the cross and we are told that but with his own blood he obtained eternal redemption according to hebrews 9 12. friends i want you to realize this picture as you see it on screen that is what happened on a hill called Mount Calvary. Jesus died for our sins. Those two other guys next to him, they didn't die for our sins, but they died for their own respective sins. What would you say, friends? If Jesus died on our friends, what would you say to him? Would you be so grateful to him? The good thing is, he is waiting for us right now to come to him and accept him as a savior are you willing to accept him as a savior if you are and have accepted him as your lord and savior he will prepare you for his coming if that is your decision let me pray for you oh dear god we thank you so much for sending your son on the cross to die for us instead of us dying on the cross we thank you so much for the gift of salvation. It's something that we cannot do for ourselves. We cannot save ourselves from our sins, but you can, oh Lord. Thank you for that. Thank you for this wonderful message. Thank you for dying on the cross. That we have accepted you. We have decided to have you as our savior, oh Lord, our personal savior, our Lord. Please help us keep our promise as being saved as we demonstrate obeying your law every day is a result of our love to you thank you dear god for answering our prayer that you will prepare us until you come in jesus name amen okay. amen thank you pastor for the wonderful message for this sabbath day that we need to always to keep the commandments and also be um uh, that a uh, focus focus with god and the adult okay so let's sing the the closing song i uh, don't forget the sabbath
O gentle, loving Savior, how good and kind Thou art! How precious is Thy promise to dwell in every heart! Welcome, welcome, ever welcome, blessed Sabbath day! Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the message for the Sabbath day that you've given us. This is indeed a holiday and also a holiday for God's people to commune with you and also with the family together. May you help us make the most of it until sunset of the Sabbath day, glorifying your name. And everything we do until the rest of the Sabbath day, Lord, be glorifying your name and a blessing to each one. You bless also the listeners right now, the viewers online, and those who are keeping the Sabbath. I also pray that those who have not been able to keep the Sabbath will be able to keep the Sabbath the next Sabbath. Come to realize that this is assigned between you and us, that you are our God, and we are your people. Thank you, dear God, for answering our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a hope in Jesus. 214. In your hymnals, you might have one verse or two verses. Hopefully you have two. 